Ann Cassidy, one of your Indianapolis Colts cheerleaders, and you're watching the Believe in Colts podcast. What's going on, Colts Nation? I'm Lawrence Owen. With me, as usual, is my guy, Gerard Powers. And today we got a heck of an episode as the NFL playoffs is going on. And the Indianapolis Colts head coaching search is, you know, heavily on underway. Uh, Gerard, how you been since we last talked? Been good, man. Been good. You know, day by day, taking one day at a time. How about you? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, I, I've missed one call for the playoffs so far this year i've gotten every winner of each game right except one and uh we're going to get into that in the second half of this of this episode but first thing we want to talk about i want to kind of get a little bit into the colts head coaching search now obviously they've already had a uh the, the first round of interviews is over with uh from what i understand ballard's cutting it down to five i don't know if he already has yet or not um but the big question is for, well, there's a couple big questions. We're going to get into both of them. Uh, first off, what kind of head coach should we get? Uh, sh- should we get a, a defensive minded head coach or an offensive minded head coach? W- what are your thoughts on that? You know, uh, I mean, it, it becomes tricky when, when you're trying to get that, that specific, I think you're just trying to get whoever is the right fit for what you have in the locker room and the right fit for just the organization. Uh, I mean, you can go out there and I mean, just like when we got Frank Wright, we thought we was getting, you know, this great offensive minded guy, which coach coach Wright is a good offensive minded coach. But, you know, it just didn't fit because of the situation, you know, luck retiring. And then we're trying this quarterback and that quarterback. And, you know, sometimes when you're trying to go the offensive route or defensive route, if everything else don't, you know, align with that within the organization, sometimes it can go left a little bit. So. Uh, if I'm Chris Ballard at this very moment right now in the search, I'm just trying to find the right guy to fit what we have. I don't care if it's a defensive guy. I don't care if it's an offensive guy. If you come in my office and we're interviewing you and you just blow us, you know, like like just unbelievably have a great interview and just blow us out of the water to where we just know when you leave in that office that you're the guy, that's who I'm choosing. You know, I don't care if you're a defensive minded guy or an offensive minded guy. Oh, wow. Uh, So that kind of brings me to a second question, which I'm going to get to in just one moment. But for the for the most part, for for right now, I want to remind everybody that bet online remains your number one source for all your sports betting season. Everything from the NFL playoffs all the way to esports, you'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news and great game trends at bet online. BetOnline features live betting, free contests, live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. The fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite leagues and events. Head to BetOnline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. BetOnline, where the game starts. Now, you talk about the interview and how big that is. Now, one of the guys that has been doing the interviews is Jeff Saturday, the, the interim head coach for the Indianapolis Colts. How heavy is that interview as opposed to his one and seven record? How, how do you weigh that if you were a GM? Well, when Jeff got the job, you know, he didn't have time to do it how he wanted to do it. He was basically a band aid to kind of hold the season, you know, together. So, uh, you know, everybody that's judging, you know, Jeff based off, you know, the record as an interim coach. And I know he said that's what he wanted to be judged on. But uh, for everybody to judge him, I mean, you got to think this guy, you know, wasn't even thinking about being a head coach until this opportunity came. You know, he wasn't at training camp. He wasn't at OTAs. He wasn't in the draft room. You know, he didn't have time to implement, you know, his ways about doing things. But one thing that I can say that Jeff did once he got the job, uh, the offensive line got better, the run game got better. You know, it was a lot of things that we were struggling with that end up being better 
you know, with Jeff, you know, at the ham. So it just lets you know his offensive mind and his ways of doing things far as from, you know, an O-line standpoint, running game uh, standpoint, and uh, just protecting the quarterback a little better. I think when Jeff, you know, became the interim head coach, I don't think our quarterback was harassed as much as it was, you know, previous. I think everything got better in that standpoint. Uh, so when you're interviewing Jeff now and you're hearing his ideas and his thoughts and what he would do from ground up, um, you know, you got you got to take that into consideration, because like I said, even though he did go one and seven, you know, as an interim head coach, he did improve a lot of things that were struggling, you know, before he got there. So, I, I mean, if, if Jeff was to get the job, I'll be eager to hear, you know, you know what his philosophy is and you know how he want to go about the offseason and doing things what type of players you know he want on his roster and things like that so when uh when i hear jim ursay and and others say that jeff got a real shot i believe him i believe that jeff got a real shot because he is that type of guy once you get a get him in that room and interview him and you hear uh, his ideas and his philosophies and the things that he want to do uh i'm pretty sure it's impressive hmm okay Okay. So if Jeff Saturday walks into that interview room and blows Chris Ballard away, you know, you're fully expecting him to probably choose him rather than, you know, some other guy like a D'Amico Ryans or something. Not, not technically, not technically. I mean, you can have a great interview and not get the job, you know, essentially. I, I'm just more so saying I feel like Jeff is has a legit shot at getting it. Um, you know, D'Amico Ryans come in there, he blows him out of the way, and maybe it's just something different about him and Jeff that they like D'Amico better. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm just more so saying that I can see Jeff having a great interview, uh, you know, when, when uh, I mean, I can see Jeff having a great interview that he's probably already and had, you know, with Jim and, and with Chris because they know him. Jim has a relationship with him and all that. And, and Jeff's a bright guy. You know, you talking about a guy that knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, thinks the game through, played 14 years, can relate to the players, you know, and all those type things. And then when you think about a guy like D'Amico or Eric, uh, I can't even say his last name. The enemy? Correctly. Yeah, I got like a little uh, speech problem. But um, no, nah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, when you think about those guys, if they come in there and they just have a great interview and they're, they're blowing it out the waters or whatnot, every interview, something's going to be different about each guy. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mean by if I'm Chris and I'm Jim, uh, I'm, I'm picking a guy that I feel just with what we have and every, in our situation and what we going on, I can just see this specific guy taking him and taking advantage of what we have rather than somebody coming in and don't really have a great idea or thoughts on, you know, what to do with this roster and this team. Okay. Okay. Um, now they're being very, you know, detailed in their search, you know, going through a lot of different interviews, a lot of different people. How do how how would you balance the fact that you want to get a head coach pretty quickly, you know, because obviously, you know, a lot of these candidates will be taken off the board as other, you know, because there's quite a few head coaching vacancies. Some have already been filled as opposed to, you know, being detailed and getting the right guy. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, you can't rush it. You can't rush it. I mean, you look at, you know, D'Amico, I think I saw a report to where he canceled his interview to uh, cancer his interview with the Colts and the Cardinals, I believe, uh, to focus on, you know, what he got on his plate right now. And you got to respect that decision. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at the Colts and, you know, them them interviewing, you know, 100 people uh, so far. You know, you want to hear everybody out. So I'm pretty sure that they're going to take their time to make sure they can get D'Amico in that room and uh, respect his decision to kind of focus on what he got, you know, at the helm right now and uh, and get things going. I think you just make sure that you got to have a head coach either sometime before the Super Bowl or right, right, right after the Super Bowl, just because you got the draft coming up, you got the combine coming up, you got all these important dates that's about to happen right when the season's over. So you want to make sure you got your guy in place and the plan is in place and uh, and, and you're in the off season ready to execute everything. So would you say that the, the, the deadline for hiring a head coach is maybe like a week after the Super Bowl? Or a week before the Super Bowl, because okay. normally in the Super Bowl, you get two weeks to prepare. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So I can see some some more interviews and maybe a decision being made uh, like the week week before the Super Bowl, where if say if it is a D'Amico Ron, he'll still have the opportunity to finish out his season and uh, finish out, you know, Super Bowl duties and all that. As soon as it's over, you know, he'll he'll pack his bags and, uh, and, and get to Indy. But if it's somebody that's not in that type of situation, of course, you'll see a, a decision, you know, before then, I think. OK, OK. Um, does a lot of people, um, have one other specific thing that kind of make them lean one way or another when it comes to fandom anyhow, and that's whether or not a head coach calls plays, whether it's defensively or offensively, there's a lot of people that do not want their head coach to make, you know, play calls. They, they want their, let the coordinators make the play calls and let them lead the team and, and, and game manage basically, uh, is there is there a, a way that maybe you lean towards in, in this situation? I, I think if you're getting a former head coach that's been doing it, you know, as a head coach his whole career, I think you let him do it. Uh, I think it is hard. I, th- I do think it is hard to call plays and manage a football game from every perspective. Uh, just because as a head coach, you got to be like the game manager for all three phases of the game, know exactly what's going on and not necessarily just focusing on whether it's defensive play calling or offensive play calling. Uh, But if it's a a new up and coming coach, like a new head coach that's never been in this uh, position before, I wouldn't recommend a new coach calling plays and trying to figure out everything else on the fly unless you just got a veteran staff that knows how to handle everything uh but it's only so many people that can can do it you know you don't see it in the league as much you got a handful of guys that do it uh but it's a hard job to do as a head coach just because you don't want to miss something uh just because you're focused on on one side of the ball and not the totality of the game and just just my my opinion though so the Colts right now do not have a starting quarterback. How how big of an effect is that going to have when it comes to bringing coaches in for interviews and selling your team as the team that, you know, a guy would want to be as a head coach? I don't think it's going to be an issue for coaches uh, just because normally when you're getting coaches to come in or, or you're hiring guys or whatever the case may be, it's a job upgrade for those guys. So when you're talking about career moves to where you're getting, you know, bumped up, you know, uh, normally coaches look at that as a great opportunity to prove themselves, especially if you don't have a quarterback right now and them coming in and whatever guy becomes the quarterback, making him, you know, big as possible or great as possible is only going to help their resume and uh in the in the coaching world so uh normally when you're in this type of situation and you know you got to find this guy or that guy and you got to hire this person or that person is normally an upgrade you know in a in the coaching world uh for guys and they look at it as a huge opportunity to prove themselves okay okay well this past weekend we had a heck of a slate of games four of them to be exact and they were very interesting uh let's jump into the first game of the week and that was the Jags at the Chiefs. And boy, the first half, I thought this game was over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chiefs look like how, you know, we expect the Chiefs to look. Uh, then all of a sudden, boom, little Nick here, Nick there, Pat Mahomes, uh, is he hurt, whatever the case may be. And then it seemed like Jacksonville just got some momentum going in their favor and they end up making this thing a game. Um, I think I said I thought it was going to be a close type of game. Uh, last week on the pod and that's what it ended up being but uh yeah I mean you just see the stage and the magnitude of everything at stake you can look at you know Kansas City and tell they got a lot of veteran guys that's been in this type of situation and it seemed like they were poised under pressure once the momentum switched a little bit and then when you look at Jacksonville you can tell it was a brand new stage for those guys Uh, a lot of guys ain't haven't felt that type of pressure uh, when you're on the road, big time playoff game, big time atmosphere. You know, we saw Christian Kirk have a drop, you know, that was huge. We see Trevor Lawrence not making certain throws and certain reads. But when you look at this Jacksonville team, man, going forward, you know, I think I think the league has kind of been put on notice that they're going to have to be somebody that, you know, everybody's going to have to deal with in the AFC for the next few years. Yeah, this was a game late in the fourth quarter. I mean, we thought, uh, I don't know what, about five minutes left in the fourth quarter of this game, the, the momentum completely shifted. Uh, yep. I, it looked like Jacksonville was going to make another comeback and win this game. 
and then two turnovers in the last four minutes of the game, right? One yep. at the five-yard line. That fumble completely changed the entire outlook of this game. And that kind of shows, you know, like what you're talking about. These are new guys, right? These, yep. these guys ain't used to being in, in this situation. I mean, Peterson has, but, you know, the players out there on the field haven't, most of them. And, you know, they're, they're going to make mistakes, and that really hurts you long term. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things to where when you're making certain mistakes in certain games, it's hard to overcome it, especially when you're on the road. I mean, you look at Jacksonville the week before, four interceptions in the first quarter, they come back and win uh, after being down 27-0. That's not normal. That that normally doesn't happen. So when you go on the road and you're having some of the same mistakes going on, some of the same situations, I think it was just a, you know, I don't want to say a wake-up call, but uh, I guess – you know, it, the, the game of football proved to be true in this aspect of it. When, you, when you're making turnovers on the road and you're making mistakes, it's just hard to overcome and, uh, and, and win. Yeah, I think the Chiefs' defense really won this game for them. As much as you want to talk about, you know, oh, yeah. Pat, Patrick Mahomes is, you know, fighting through his injury and Kelsey's out there doing Kelsey things, I felt like this Chiefs' defense came out there and just played some hard-nosed football the entire 60 minutes. No, nah, Chiefs defense plays some good ball, man. They look good. Secondary playing tight coverage, uh, D line getting all, getting after it, linebackers flying around. Uh, so yeah, the Chiefs definitely came up big, especially in the clutch when the game's on the line. They needed turnovers, and that's what they got. Uh, but uh, you you mentioned Travis Kelsey. I mean, it's crazy to think that you know he is great as he is, just because like when you when you're game planning. Trust me, like. It's a lot of people out there that be saying, like, how can Travis Kelsey get this open? Like, how do we not see two people? Like, when you're game planning, trust me, I'm pretty sure Mike Caldwell and those defensive guys on, on the staff at Jacksonville let every person know in that defensive room, hey, we got to know where 87's at at all times. But sometimes when you're facing, you know, good offensive coordinators and good offensive schemes, you know, they do a good job in making sure they, they're creating matchups they want. And Travis Kelsey, man, I mean, you're talking about a first ballot Hall of Famer that's still putting up great numbers year after year. And I mean, it's just unbelievable to watch, especially when we're talking about playoff football because he knows he's the focus. He knows that he's going to face double teams and uh, and stuff like that throughout the game. And to see him still be as productive in the big moment, man, it's impressive. Absolutely. Now, Travis Kelsey is 33 years old and still playing at an all-pro level. Wow. At tight end, that's pretty darn impressive. Where would you rank Travis Kelsey all time at the tight end position? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, obviously, Tony Gonzalez is, you know, up there. If he's not one, he's two. I mean, Shannon Sharp is up there. Um, if if I, I I'm top four, top five. I mean, when you when you look at his his numbers, I want to say he's went over a thousand yards like every single year. Uh, uh, almost every single year of his career, however many touchdowns every single year. I mean, it's just hard not to deny the numbers, uh, you know, when it comes down to, you know, ranking him all time and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, one year he damn near led the league in, in reception. I mean, in, 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 in yards at, from a tight end position, he almost led the league or he did lead the league. It was one of those years. It, it was real close. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with all the great tight ends that have played this game. Obviously, I mean, I played against Tony Gonzalez, and Gronk. I know, yeah, Gronk. Gronk's definitely up there, but I, I think Travis had made his case to be top five, top three, however you want to put it, because uh, you can't deny his numbers at the end of the day. Oh no, you're you're, you're absolutely right. This dude has went to six, seven straight Pro Bowls, seven straight <laughs> Pro Bowls since 2015, and. Uh, you talked about, you know, all these years in a row of being over a thousand yards. He's been over a thousand yards since the 2016 season. Got you. Every yep. year. Every since year. Then. Every <laughs> stinking year. And four all pros. Dude has been an absolute phenom since he's walked into the league. Obviously, you know, it's his rookie year didn't go quite the way he wanted. Uh, didn't really get much, you know, play time in that situation, but uh, from 2014 on, he has just been an absolute stud and shows no signs. He's, he's like he, he's like the Tom Brady of the tight ends. I mean, this dude shows no signs yeah. of slowing down I mean, at all. He got swag. <laughs> he, he got culture about him. He ain't scared of nothing. He's a dog. And then he got a brother that's going to be in the Hall of Fame as well. So that's a pretty cool story. 
pretty Absolutely. cool story with them too. Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to the other game, uh, the Giants and Eagles. This was by that, far the biggest. Wow. I uh, think it was one of those prove it games for the Giants. I mean, for the Eagles. Uh, I don't think they wanted to play around at all. They didn't want to make this, you know, a game in the fourth quarter. I think they wanted to jump out on these boys fast and and just keep the foot on the pedal the entire game. And that's what it looked like. I mean, the Giants had a great year getting to this point. Uh, and, and getting there, I actually thought this game was going to be a lot closer just because of the rivalry, division foes, and, and things like that. But, shoot, that, that Eagles defense, Jalen Hurts and that offense and those weapons, uh, I mean, they look dangerous. But I did see uh, A.J. Brown a little upset on the sideline, and I don't know if it was from a standpoint of production or certain plays or not getting the ball. But, you know, uh, you, you normally don't see, you know, superstars like that upset when you're winning as big as you're winning. So I saw him on the sideline kind of, you know, brushing some people off. I wonder, is there any smoke with that going on? But from the outside looking in, man, Eagles offense, Eagles defense, special teams, I mean, that, that, they're locked in. They're locked in for sure. Yeah, Eagles didn't have to throw the ball that much, right? And A.J. Brown only had three catches for 22 yards. So I, I understand the situation that he's going through. I think they had a total of like 150 yards passing this okay. entire game, right? They went to the ground. And, mm. you know, when you have a good run game, you lean on that. I mean, they had over 200 yards rushing, you know, yep. what, what 260 yards rushing, if I, if I remember correctly, 270 maybe. Uh, and that's that's what Jalen Hurts 30 Four thirty-five yards rushing, um, but Gainwell, Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, those guys really ground and pounded the football very, very well. And, and you talk about the defense holding the Giants down to nil. I mean, I mean, it wasn't nobody open. There was no run lanes open. I mean, they were locked in. I mean, you could just tell they played mistake-free football. You know, it wasn't any MAs. It wasn't any bus out there. Everybody was locked in, making plays on the ball, you know, uh, gang tackling, you know, Barkley, you know, doing everything that you got to do in playoff football for the defense for sure. Absolutely. Um, they, they were getting to Daniel Jones a lot in this game. Five sacks for the Eagles defense. And, you know, they, they didn't create a lot of turnovers. There was one interception, no fumbles. Uh, a lot of three Giants. and outs, though. A lot, a lot of three, of three and outs. Three and out. Absolutely. Time of possession was heavily in uh, in the Eagles' favor. Of, of you know, they had more than ten minutes more of the football than what the Giants did. And when you when you held the the time of possession that much, and you're running the football and doing it effectively, that dictates the entire game. The yeah, entire yeah. game. Yeah, especially when you can't move the ball. When you can't move the ball and. You know, it's punt after punt, and, you know, the other the other side is getting it, and your defense is out there fighting their butts off. But, you know, at some point it's going to break. I mean, you just saw a different physical type of uh, style that the Eagles, you know, brought. And, I mean, that's playoff football at the end of the day. You want to win by any means necessary. It ain't necessarily got to be the prettiest. But when you watch that game, it just looked like a more physical football team, and that's that's it seemed like that's what, you know, they wanted to do going into that game is just show that physicality. Absolutely. I think that's one of the reasons why A.J. Brown might have been a little upset. Now, obviously, I'm just, you know, kind of uh, taking guesses here. I don't know for sure, obviously. But, I mean, like I said, Hurts, Hurts didn't throw the ball very much, 150 yards, you know, ran the ball only 30 yards. They didn't throw it very much. They That's – it's weird when you're talking about how Devonta Smith and A.J. Brown are not making, you know, all the impactful play. Now, Devonta had a couple – Big, big plays, yeah. yeah. A couple big plays, including that touchdown. But um, for the most part, you're right. I mean, the Eagles showed the world we're not just that team. We can't. We don't have to just rely on everything Jalen Hurts. We can run the football down your throat. And when you're multidimensional like that, that's scary. No, nah, that's very scary. That's why I can't wait, you know, for this next matchup with them and the 49ers because the 49ers pride themselves off being physical as well. Defense, mm -hmm. offense, special teams. So it's going to be in Philly. That's going to be that's going to be one to watch. Absolutely. Another game that was a bit of a blowout. And I, I'm surprised that the Bills even put points on the board in this game. The Cincinnati mm -hmm. Bengals and Buffalo Bills. Cincinnati blows them out right out the gates. Bills looked bad from the start, and the Bengals' offense come out, looked unstoppable. In the slushy-ass snow out there at that, you know, and they're throwing the ball around like left and right. No one could stop anybody. 
What's your thoughts on this game? I mean, they look like the identity of their quarterback. I mean, you look at Joe Burrow and how he carries himself and, and what he represents, and it just seems like he's bleeded through the entire team and everybody carries the same swag, the same confidence. I mean, you interview Joe Burrow, and they ask about a window, and he says, it's my whole career. You talk to Jamar Chase or – Boyd or or any of those receivers and they're saying can't nobody guard us can't nobody do it. it's just a certain confidence that when the Bengals walk into your stadium or walk in on, onto any field that you know that they're they're bringing their a game at the end of the day and you're gonna have to be good to beat them um so for them to go up there and play the bills they were already pissed off about you know them um uh, having a neutral site for the AFC championship and selling tickets and, and doing all that stuff. So they went they went up there with a little chip on their shoulder and it looked like they they were the team that's used to the snow, used to the the bad weather and used to all these type things. And, you know, they didn't blink an eye. And then when you look at the the Bills side of the ball, it just looked like everybody is frustrated. It just looked like everybody is not on the same page. I mean, you got Stefan Diggs telling Josh Allen to throw the ball up early in the game, you know, stop throwing it low then you got them arguing on the sideline uh and that and their defense has been banged up all year and i mean it's a testament you know to their defensive coordinator leslie Fra uh, frazier that they were the, uh so good all year without some of their main pieces and i, I just think in the playoffs i mean it just kind of hurt them that they you know had so many injuries and uh you know just couldn't hold up to their side of the stick but you know the Bengals I didn't think that they were going to get it done you know especially off of last year them having the momentum Joe Burrow getting beat up offensive line can't protect them I thought it was a little bit of momentum that got them to the Super Bowl I definitely knew that they were going to be good this year but I didn't see them getting back to the AFC championship and they got a legit shot and getting back to the Super Bowl absolutely um I mean Joe Burrow's beating Pat Mahomes every time he's played him so far. So here, here we go on another big stage, you know, and I know Pat want this one. I know, I know Pat Mahomes wanted this game right here. So uh, another big stage, and it seemed like Joe Burrow thrives in these type of moments. So uh, I, think, I think Vegas is going to have a, a, you know, a great betting situation with this one right here coming up. Yeah, I think so, too. Now, when it comes to the running game, the running game in this game was so important. I mean, so important. I mean, you're you're sitting here in snow, slush, freezing cold weather out there, and the Bengals run the ball. Non-quarterback runs 28 times. The Bills non-quarterback runs 11. All right? And to me, that shows the whole game, right? I mean, I, I understand the Bills don't do a lot of non-quarterback runs, but traditionally, even though they don't do it often, they usually are still pretty darn effective. Um, where do you put the loss on this? Is this a Josh Allen thing, or is this a, a play calling thing? Uh, I mean, I don't. I, I just think it's the the entire team. Like I said, defensively, a lot of injuries, beat up. I'm oh, talking about. My. I'm talking like superstar injuries, you know, beat up. And then when you look at offensively, I remember at the trade deadline, everybody was thinking Christian McCaffrey, you know, was a possibility of going to the Bills. So they knew they needed, you know, a solid running back to get their run game going. And I think in play in the playoffs, obviously, defensive coordinators are going to try to expose your weaknesses. And at the end of the day, the Bills don't have a solid running game. And and uh, and I think they were exposed a little bit. And then when you have to throw it as much as they were trying to throw it, when it's bad conditions like that, I mean, it's not going to be great. I mean, it's just not – it's just too hard to do. The ball's wet. Wide receivers don't have the best grip. You know, you can't run your routes like how you normally run your routes. And defensively, you're kind of just – kind of sitting and waiting uh you know pretty much i mean it's i mean it's hard still because you got to deal with the traction and all those things too but when you got when you're guarding stefan Diggs and you ain't got to worry about him making two or three moves just because of the get conditions are too bad and you know you're going to slip or you're going to do stuff like that it kind of eases your mind a little bit you know as a defender uh so when when you're trying to throw it that much in those type of conditions, I mean, I think they were exposed that, you know, this offseason, they got to go get a run game at the end of the day. I mean, they have to. As a former quarterback. And, uh, not to cut you off, but the last three, four games, Josh Allen has had a turnover problem. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it definitely needs to be addressed. Um, I mean, we put a lot of expectations on the Bills this year, you know, and it, going into this offseason and going into this season, everybody had them as Super Bowl favorites, or a lot of people did. And uh, so one of the first times they had to deal with that type of pressure, and then we see towards the end of the year, Josh Allen over 30 turnovers, uh, you know, the last four or five games, whether it's fumbles, picks, or whatever the case may be. Uh, I mean, this season, I mean, that's that's uncharacteristic, and we're going to have to see him improve this offseason as well from that aspect. Absolutely. The Bills had eight penalties in this game. Trey White had half of them uh, in this game. As a former cornerback, what would you, uh, you know, take me through what, what what's going on with Trey White in this game? I don't know. When you, when you have a couple penalties, I mean, definitely going to mess up your confidence a little bit. But, um, you know, he's one of those type of corners. He's going to play his style of football. I mean, and as a professional, you got to adjust the way that the game is being called. And, uh, and you know, you expect to see him adjust. But, you know, I mean, sometimes it's one of those games when you're playing against the best receiver and you're matching up. And uh, and you're in those type of situations and you know the ball is going to come to you and you're targeted. Uh, I mean, you're going to have them close you know, type calls to where they just don't go in your favor. And, uh, I mean, you never as a corner want to have, you know, four penalties in a game. I mean, that's a horrible, horrible day to have. But once you got a couple and then you realize the situation, like you're down and you're losing and you're trying to make a play and you're trying to just do something to get the ball back or switch the momentum, uh, you're going to be aggressive sometimes. And sometimes those calls are just going to go the opposite way. Okay. Okay. Last game. Oh, the last night game, that was a defense fest, uh, it, quite frankly. Now, Dak did not look good in this game, in my opinion, at all. I think he should have thrown four interceptions. Yeah, well, I think it was two that was dropped. Yeah, I, I, I he had two that, that, was, that was caught, and I believe there was two that was just dropped. And he hit defenders right in the hand, made breaks on the ball. They hit him in the hands. They dropped him. I, one of them was Greenlaw, I think. Had he caught that, it's pick six the other way. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was bad. Um, but they still kept it close because we talked about how good these defenses on both the sides uh, of the teams are. This game came down to the wire. Uh, it was a seven-point game, 12 to 19. What a weird score for an NFL game. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, but we knew Brock Purdy has not been in this type of situation mm-hmm. before, so I didn't expect them to just light it up on the offensive side just because Dallas has a great defense as well. Mm-hmm. Great pass rush, got some good guys in the secondary. Um, and then on the, the flip side, I mean, everybody knows San Fran has had the top defense all year in the league as well. So you knew Dak was going to be under duress. You knew he was going to be under some pressure. Didn't expect him to play as bad as he played, uh, especially coming off of how he played the week before. Uh, but, you know, give a testament to D'Amico Rons and his scheme and how he was baiting Dak to do certain things. And, you know, I think I think sometimes Dak seemed like he was getting rid of the ball a little bit like late like he was a half a second late in uh letting the ball go and whether that's the pass rush getting to his face to allow time or that's Dak you know not realizing what the coverage is and maybe second guessing himself because it just seems like some of those balls it was just you know not on time so uh I mean I, I, I love the defensive games when it comes to the playoffs just because I mean you can just see everybody that's that's locked in from that side and the offense trying to figure out or or just trying to break that code and then once it's broke it just seems like the floodgates would be open but it seemed like both defenses kept the offense at base i mean at bay and um you know san fran found ways to make plays toward the end of the game to separate themselves i think it had a yeah i think you're right and and it's 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 about your playmakers making plays and And winning, winning their matchups. Exactly. And, you know, defensively, the, the, the Cowboys, I think they came in with the game plan to stop Christian McCaffrey and get in the face mm-hmm. of Brock Purdy. And I think they did they that did. pretty much the entire game. But yep. you still got Debo Samuel and George Kittle out there. And if you yep. can't stop them as well, that's just not going to be a good game. See, and that's, and uh, yeah, like you mentioned, George Kittle, um, you know, with all these other weapons that, you know, the 49ers have, I think we've kind of relaxed on Kittle a little bit just because he's not the type of guy that complains. He's not the guy that's, you know, going on the sideline, wondering why he's not getting the ball. And then you play a game like he played, you know, the other day. 
and he's the one that's making the big catches and the unbelievable, you know, this and that. So, I mean, it just shows you the type of team and the type of vets that those guys have. I mean, those guys just want to win. There's nobody complaining about not getting this or not doing this or why are we doing this. I mean, I think they realize the situation. They got a rookie quarterback that needs all those vets and everybody around him to be on the same page just because – this is only what Brock's six start, seven start, and nobody expected him to be in this dang position. So he's not the one that's that's the the vocal leader or the the main one that's leading the troops. I mean, he's still in the in the follow mode just because he don't know what the hell is going on. He's never been in this situation. I mean, I think you saw Kyle Shanahan blowing him up one time for just trying to do too much on one play. I think he was scrambling, trying to do something and uh, threw the ball away late to where it could have been a pick or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he goes to the sideline and you see Shanahan covering his mouth, but you could tell Shanahan was giving him an earful just because you don't want Brock in a situation where he has to win the game for you. You got too many playmakers and you're too good of a team to where it's like, Brock, just manage the game, do what you've been doing, let everybody else go out there and win it. And I think that's been the key to the 49er success since he's been at the helm. It seems like every playoffs, every year in the playoffs, George Kittle makes a catch. He has no business catching, no mm -hmm. business at all. And this game, he had one over the middle that I don't know how he caught that football. He Man. reached out there and tipped that to himself like five times. And still came down with it. And Diggs took like closed his eyes or something. It should have been a kill shot by by Diggs. And he just like closed his eyes or did some and just totally missed him. But that was a hell of a play by Kittle for sure and staying focused and making sure he got that grab. Absolutely. Diggs dropped an interception. He did. Uh, that we normally and he got some of the best hands in the league. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about he dropped an easy one. Yes, he did. Uh but again, now we got a game that, you know. In all honesty, this is kind of expected. Uh, I, I think most people saw both these championships uh, that, that, that we're getting ready to see, uh, at least close, right? Yeah. yeah. Chiefs, Chiefs, Bengals. It was good. We all thought it was going to be Chiefs, Bengals, or, or Bills. Bills. Yep. Right. And then I think most people saw the Eagles and Niners um, yep. coming out of this. So not a whole lot of big surprises coming out. But uh, still good game over on the divisional weekend. Uh, any final words before we end this episode? No, nah, man, I'm looking forward to this, uh, the, the Eagles 49ers. Uh, I mean, you got Jalen Hurts. And even though it's his, what, third year, second year, uh, I mean, he's playing like a savvy vet. And then you look on the other side and you got Brock Purdy, who's in his seventh start. And he don't know nothing else but win. I mean, he hasn't even faced a loss yet as a starter. Uh, but what's cool about them two is their last year and well, Jalen Hurts last year in college, him and Brock Purdy went at it, you know, when Brock was at Iowa State. And I think Brock threw for three or four touchdowns, like almost 300 yards. And Jalen Hurts has similar numbers. So they're familiar with going against each other. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool for the NFC championship to be these two young quarterbacks when we're in a league with so many veteran guys and all those type things. It just feels like the younger generation of quarterbacks are starting to, you know, push their way up into the conversation of, you know, uh, franchise guys around the league. Okay. All right. Well, this was Believe in Colts brought to you by Bet Online. I'm Lawrence Owen. That was Gerard Powers. And as usual, go Colts. Do you believe? 